Amen. Have you ever felt like God is stuck? In other words, maybe something that you're going through or something that you're facing is really a tough spot. And you think to yourself, man, God, are you going to do this? How is this going to work? What's going to happen? I want to tell you this morning, this, the title of my message is this, God's got this. No matter what you're going through in life, no matter what you're facing, God's got this. It doesn't take him by surprise. In fact, he even knows before you even tell him what's ailing you. Not only that, but God also sees deep in the recesses of your heart and of your soul and of your mind. He sees those things, and he knows that you and I struggle with different things. But God got this. He's more powerful than any situation or circumstance or sickness or disease that you may face. And the reason is why? Because God's got this. Amen. I want you to turn in your Bibles with me, please, to the book of Acts. I'm going to take my jacket off because it's hot up here. That's saying 74 on the thermometer there. Thank you. Is this okay? I can do this, I can have a little liberty. You know, in the early church, you couldn't show your arms, you couldn't show your legs, you couldn't do anything. Today, boy, I'll tell you, whew, you've got to be careful. Praise God. It's good to see each and every one of you here this morning. Glad you're with us. Glad you could be with us. I want to turn to Acts 27. It's when the Apostle Paul was taken as a prisoner to Rome. And they were about ready to leave for Italy. Wouldn't it be nice to go to Italy, huh? I'll tell you, you go to some of these little towns in Italy and you go to these little mom and pop restaurants. Boy, they cook that authentic uh, Italian food. And, you know, I'll tell you, there's nothing like home-cooked Italian food. You know, we go to a little place in Boston. It's on Hanover Street. It's not the fanciest place in the world doesn't have the chandeliers and all of that. It's a little tiny place, maybe I would say three quarters of the size of this from here back and from here to the wall. Very small place, but the food is absolutely excellent. In fact, when I have the opportunity and Pastor Tom and I go there, he has the veal pizziola. And uh, he ate that veal one time and he said, boy, if there was no people in here, I would lick the plate. It's that good. So Italy... What a place to go. And so here, Paul is, is on his way to Italy. And I was wondering, could I have someone come up here and read the scripture for me? I might stop you in between, but I want you to come up. I need a volunteer. Come on, somebody. Oh, come on. Okay, you're going to start reading from verse 1. Acts 27, verse 1. You know you're on TV, right? We want to welcome those who are watching live by Facebook. This is my adopted daughter in the Lord. You forgot about TV? Why are your legs shaking? Okay. And when it was determined that we should sail into Italy, they delivered Paul and certain other prisoners unto one named Julius, a centurion of Augustus band, and entering into a ship of Adreno, Tim, Tim, we launched, meaning to sail by the coast of Asia, one Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonia, being with us. And the next day we touched at Sidon, and Julius courteously entreated Paul and gave him liberty to go unto his friends to refresh himself. 
And when he was launched from thence, we sailed unto Cyprus, because the winds were contrary. And when we had sailed over the sea of Sicilia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra, a city of Lycia. And there the centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing into Italy, and he put us therein. And when we had sailed slowly many days, and scarce were come over against Snida, the wind not suffering us, we sailed under Crete over against Salm Salmon. And hardly passing it, came unto a place which is called the Fair Havens, nigh whereunto was the city of Lycia. Now when much time was spent, and when sailing was now dangerous because of the fast was not already passed, Paul admonished them and s said unto them, Sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage, not only of the la lading and ship, but also of our lives. Nevertheless, the centurion believed the master and the owner of the ship more than those things which were spoken by Paul. And because the haven was not um, commodious to winter in, the more part advised to depart thence also, if by any means there might attain to Phineas and there to winter, which is a haven of Crete, and lieth towards the southwest and northwest. Praise the Lord. Give her a good... God bless you. He, he did wonderful. Here's the scene. Paul is on the ship as a prisoner. All these, all these people on the ship were prisoners. They were going to Rome to be judged. They were in chains, and they were facing all kinds of adversity. You understand, this was wintertime, so it was cold, and those ships didn't have heaters in them. And uh, those uh, prisoners were there uh, with nothing really to look forward to but judgment when they would come to Rome. And so as they're in this ship, they're sailing all over this. The winds were contrary. The winds were blowing really hard. It was a real storm. And so they made it into port, and they stayed in this port for a little while. And then it says in verse 13, now let me back up for a minute. I want to see the part where, uh, verse 11, please. Go to verse 11 for me. I want to comment on that. It says, Nevertheless, the centurion believed the master and the owner of the ship more than those things which were spoken by Paul. I want you to understand that that's when we get in trouble. When we don't listen to God and we listen to man, we can get into trouble. Come on, somebody. Now, I can understand sometimes the reasoning that people use, but this kind of reasoning is, is not acceptable to me. Now, in the natural, it says the centurion believed the master and the owner of the ship more than those things which were spoken by Paul. And in the natural, Paul was not a sailor. He was a tent maker. His trade was tent making before he uh, gave his life over to Christ and surrendered his life to preaching the gospel the rest of his life. And so he was, a, he was a tent maker, and you can almost hear the words of the master of the owners of the ship and those that were in charge of the ship saying to themselves, who is this guy giving us nautical advice? He's a tent maker, condemned, going to Rome to be judged for the crimes that are against him. Who is he to tell us who have been sailing these waters for many years? We know these waters like the back of our hands. And so why is he telling us? And so what happened was they rather believed the master and the owner of the ship more than those things that were spoken by Paul. But here's the key, and this is where sometimes we miss it. When someone speaks into your life, Sometime it isn't them, it's God using them. Amen. God can, can use somebody to speak into your life, 
And you have to be willing to hear and not look and say, well, that's the person. Because God may be speaking and using that person. And sometimes you're crying out to God, God, why aren't you answering me? And then God will send someone and say it to you, and you still don't believe it. Come on. And so they would rather believe the master of the ship and the owner of the ship more than the man of God. That's where we get in trouble. Now, always, always, always line up what the man of God says with the word of God. Just don't go by what the man of God says. Line it up to the word of God. That's your assurance, your insurance right there. If it doesn't line up with this word right here, you don't have to listen. Amen. Come on, somebody. And verse 13 says, And when the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their purpose for loosing. Oh, all the elements look good. Probably nice, even though it was cold, nice sunny day, you know. Wind blew softly. Hey, you know, this is, this is the time that we need to go. This is they loose then since they sailed close by Crete. Verse 14, but not long after there arose against it a tempestuous wind named Euroclidon. That was a typhoon. Hello? Strong winds. Came up against the ship. Now, if you and I were in that ship, we'd be binding the devil. Come on, somebody. Trying to take control over all of that. But sometimes, God is the one who's in charge of the storm. Sometimes when you're going through the valley, when you're going through the flood, when you're going through the fire in the things of life that you face, you want to scream at the devil, bind the devil, plead the blood against the devil, when all the time God is allowing the storm. Hmm, come on, somebody. I'm going to... Take for a moment Psalm 107. If you go there with me for a moment. In verse, let's start with verse 20. It says, he sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. But look further down. Verse 24. Oh, I'm sorry. Go to verse 23. They that go down to the sea in ships that do business in great waters. And, you know, there was some cargo on that ship with Paul. A bunch of wheat. It was not only a transport ship, but it was also a cargo ship. It says, These see the works of the Lord and the wonders of, in the deep. For he commandeth and raiseth the stormy wind. Not the devil, although the devil can do that, cause but you've got to know the difference. And I believe in this case with Paul, it was God who raised up the stormy wind because they wouldn't hear and adhere to the man of God, what he said. It's he that commands and raised the stormy wind, which lifted up the waves thereof. 
And they mount up to the heavens. They go down again to the depths. That was a real powerful storm. Linda and I, we were on a cruise one time, and we were right in the center of the ship, and our, our room had a balcony, and we were leaning over the balcony. It was very, very stormy that day. And it was 17-foot waves. <clears throat> and when the front of the ship would go over the wave and slap it, the spray would come. We could feel the spray from the front of the ship halfway, halfway in the middle. We could feel the spray. That's how people were sick all over the place. They had bags all over the place for people. It was really, really rough. But we were okay, you know. Look what it says. Verse 27. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man and are at their wit's end. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he bringeth them out of their distresses. He makes the storm a calm so that the waves thereof are still. Then are they glad because they be quiet, so he bringeth them unto their desired haven. In other words, no matter what you go through, no matter what storm in life you go through, you're going to make it to the other side. I don't care how rough it gets. I don't care how rocky it gets. God's got this. Hallelujah. 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 It says in verse 13, And when the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, loosing there, they, they went close to Crete. But not long after that arose against its a temp, temp, tempestuous wind called Euroclidon. And when the ship was caught and could not bear up into the wind, we let her drive. What does that mean, we let her drive? They let go of the rudder. And now they were at the mercy of the wind. Sometimes you cannot control the things that are coming against you. Sometimes you cannot maneuver that thing in the direction you want it to go. And that's when you've got to throw your hands up and let the rudder go where it will. Because I want you to know that even when you let go of steering the ship or steering the situation or the circumstance that you're in, even when you let go, God's got this. He does. He's got it. Watch, you're going to see this. It's so beautiful in Scripture. And running under a certain island, which is called Clauda, we had much work to come by the boat, which when they had taken up, they used helps undergirding the ship, and fearing lest they should fall into the quicksand, they stroked the sail, they striked the sail, and so were driven. And we being exceedingly tossed with a tempest. That's pretty rough. Understand, these ships were not that big. They're not like the tankers we have today. The next day, they lightened the ship. In other words, they started to get rid of stuff, throwing it overboard. And the third day, we cast out with our own hands the tackling of the ship. And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, when it seems like what you're going through When it seems like what you're going through is not going to come to an end. You don't see any rays of sunshine at the end. You're still in the storm. It's dark. It's still, you're still going through the process of things. We didn't, neither sun or moon or stars were appeared and no small tempest laid on us. Look what this says. All hope, say all hope, that we should be saved was then taken away. I want you to understand, sometimes God allows that. For you to get to the point, whatever you're going through in life, 
whatever, you, whatever trials and tribulations you see, God allows you to get to that point sometimes of hope is totally gone. No one can help you. No one can say the words that they need to say to you to bring comfort or strength. When you come to the end of that place and you feel like there is no more hope, God's got this. Hallelujah. God's got this. When all hope was taken away, when it looked like this is it, this is it, we're lost. Verse 21 says, but after a long abstinence, Paul wasn't jumping to the forefront saying, see, I told you. He waited a long time. But then it came a time when he stood forth in the midst of them and he said, sirs, you should have hearkened unto me and not have loose from Crete and to have gained this harm and loss. They lost all of their cargo. The very purpose of them going to make a, a profit now was lost. Their time was lost. Their cargo was lost. All their hope was gone of even surviving. Next verse, please. He says, and now I exhort you to be of good cheer. Wait a minute. You're telling me to be of good cheer? You're telling me to be happy? When all hope is lost and we lost all our cargo and we lost everything and you're asking me now to be of good cheer? Don't you know what I'm going through? You don't know the depth of what I'm feeling. How can you tell me to be of good cheer? But here is where hope comes back in. For there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but only the ship. Now, They've got to make a choice to either listen to the man of God or to believe and look at the circumstances that they're in. Hello? If you focus on the things that is happening in your life, you'll miss God. But if you focus is on God and what God's word says. And you'll believe that God's got this thing. You don't have to worry about it. Next verse, please. And then he explains and gives them the reason. He says, for there stood by me this night the angel of God. Do you believe God sends his angels? Oh, yes. There's an angel over Israel. His name is Michael, the archangel. He protects Israel. See, God has a special purpose for Israel. God's not done with Israel. I don't care how rebellious they are, how they turn their back on God, because God has a purpose for Israel, and he has a purpose to fulfill the prophetic decrees that he made in the word of God. When Jesus comes back, he's not coming to New York City. When Jesus comes back, he's not coming to Massachusetts. He's not coming to Rome. He's not coming to England, not coming to Africa. He's coming back to Israel. The Bible says that his feet are going to touch the Mount of Olives. In fact, if you go in the book of Acts in the beginning, you'll see that 
when Jesus was ready to be ascended, there was over 500 witnesses that watched him go. And when he went up, those two angels spoke and said, Why stand you here gazing into heaven? Listen to this. This same Jesus, not another one. This same Jesus will come in so like manner as you have seen him go. He was up in a cloud. He was taken up into a cloud. Damn. He's coming back, the Bible says, in the clouds. And his feet are going to touch the Mount of Olives. And I'll tell you, there was no ex more exciting thing than Linda and I when we stood on the Mount of Olives in Israel. We stood, in, we stood on that mountain where he ascended up. Hallelujah. And he's coming back for this, to the same mountain. And the Bible says that mountain will split in two when he comes. Read Zechariah. If that doesn't get you excited, something's wrong with you. He said, but there stood this night an angel of God who, whose I am and whom I serve. So this was a Christophany, if you will. I believe it was Jesus appearing to him like he did on the road to Damascus. Because the word angel here doesn't necessarily mean an angel. It could be a messenger, the Greek word. Next verse, please. And the angel spoke to Paul and said, Fear not, Paul. Isn't that wonderful that angels know your name? There's a supernatural realm, but there's a natural realm. And the supernatural knows more about the natural realm than you and I do. He said, fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar. Remember the prophet that came, I think it was Agabus, that came to Paul and wrapped his hands in, like this and said, so shall they do to you and bring you in, into bondage into, into Rome and Jerusalem. You're going to go. That's a, that was a prophet that spoke that. So that word had to come to pass. He said, lo, God hath given you, listen to me, God hath given thee all them that sail with you. Paul, I'm giving them to you. Whew. In other words, he's going to instruct them, he's going to tell them what they need to do. Next verse. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer. Again, he tells them, cheer up. For I believe the circumstances and the situations that I'm in. I believe in the hurt and the pain and the sorrow that I'm going through. What does it say? I believe God. What do you believe that about God? God's got this. That it shall be even as it was told me. When the Bible says, fear not, for I have redeemed you. Hear me now. I have called you by your name. Thou art mine. You belong to God, when you pass through the waters, you're not going to avoid the waters. He says, but when you pass through the waters, they shall not overflow thee. And when you pass through the fire, why? Why won't the waters overflow you? Why will not the flames kindle upon you? Because you are his. He has called you by your name. You belong to him. So remember these words when you're going through the trial. God's got this. Let that ring in your spirit. When you're going through the valley of the shadow of death. 
The Bible says, I will fear no evil. Why? Because God's got this. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When I walk into the trials and tribulations of life, God's got this. Hallelujah. Next verse. Howbeit we must be cast upon a certain island. Hallelujah. Now understand this now. This ship is at the mercy of the winds. I read to you in Psalm 107 that the Lord is in charge of the winds and he drives the winds. God's in control. But the ship and the, and the navigator or the captain has nothing to control this ship. It's on its own. Next verse, please. Got to finish. But when the 14th night was come, as we were driven up and down in Andrea, about midnight, the shipmen deemed that they drew near to some country. At midnight. Next verse, please. And sounded and found it 20 fathoms. And when they had gone a little further, they sounded again and found it 15 fathoms. They had a, a rope, what they would do, and it was measured. And they would lower the rope to find out how deep the water was. Next verse. I don't have time. Then fearing lest we should have fallen upon the rocks, they cast four anchors out of the stern, and they wished for the day. Still trying. Still trying. Next verse, please. And as the shipmen were about to flee out of the ship, they began to let down the boats, the little boats, into the sea under the color as though they would have cast anchors out of the foreship. In other words, they were secretly doing this because the Probably the shipmaster and those that were in charge said, we're getting out of here. Next verse. But Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, except these abide in the ship, you cannot be saved. There's a warning. Unless you abide in the ship, you cannot be saved. In other words, when persecution comes because you're a Christian, don't hightail it. Don't run. Don't fear. I know you heard the news of that, that uh, mosque in New Zealand that was attacked by that white supremacist. 49 people killed. But let me ask you this question. Have you heard about the murders in Nigeria on the news? As of February, 129 Christians were slaughtered in Nigeria. Have you heard about it? They're killing Christians every single day. You don't hear about it. Oh, but Muslims, oh, watch out now. You're going to hear it all. I heard it all day long, and I, I put something on Facebook about it. I said, why is it that when it's a Muslim, they hear it all day long on the news, but when it's Christians, you don't hear nothing about it? Let me tell you, unless you abide in this ship called salvation, you cannot be saved. Stay with Jesus. Don't let the winds and the waves of the world and the things of this world shake you out of your faith. Now, they had an option. They could have said to Paul, hey, forget you. We're getting out of here. See, they didn't let their fear make the decision for them. They stopped for a moment and said, you know what? This Paul told us about this. <laughs> he said this was going to happen. 
that we were going to lose this ship. Maybe we should start listening to him. Next verse. Then the soldiers cut off the ropes of the boat and they let it fall off. They listened. Next verse. And while the day was coming on, Paul besought them all to take me, saying, This day is the fourteenth day that you have tarried and continued fasting, having taken nothing. Now think about it. They're going through all of this trial, all this tribulation, all this rough weather. <coughs> the waves taking that ship, tossing it up and down, up and down, left and right. I don't want to do too much because Linda will be sick. Linda gets sick backing up out of the driveway. And they hadn't eaten in 14 days. Now, some of us, we can't even go a day without food. Two days without food. Three days without food. I'll tell you, sometimes when people go on a fast, boy, they get nasty. They don't eat, man, and all of a sudden they're seeing hamburgers flying through the air and ice cream cones and all kinds of stuff being tempted. They had eaten nothing. Next verse. He said, Wherefore I pray you take some meat, for this is for your health. For there shall not a hair fall from the head of any of you. How did he know that? How could a man decree that over somebody and tell him you're not going to lose one hair of your head? How did he know that? Because God told him, all that are with you, I'm giving to you. Not one will be lost. You can trust in what God says. You can trust what God says. That's why I tell you, listen, know this Bible. You're going to need to know it because I'm telling you, there's coming a time before the rapture where the church is going to get persecuted. Here in America, it's already happening. Think about it. You can't even wear a red hat that says, make America great again without being called a racist, a bigot, or whatever it is. And that's not the truth. Nobody knows who you are. There's no more dialogue. There's no more, let's debate this. Let's talk about this. Let's, let's discuss it. That's how situations and circumstances are resolved. It's through talking, communication. They want to wipe that out. No. Oh, you, you can't express how you feel, but I'm supposed to express how I feel? I'm telling you, your rights are being slowly taken away. Freedom of speech is slowly being taken away through that Politically correct speech. Telling you what you can say, when you can say it. Now, I'm not talking about hurting someone's feelings. You shouldn't, shouldn't do that. But you know what? If they can control speech, then you can't come against sin. And that's what the devil wants. He doesn't want sin to be revealed. That's why you go into a lot of churches today. You don't hear anything about sin. You don't hear anything more about the blood of Jesus. You don't hear about hell anymore. You don't hear about judgment anymore. Those are foreign things in many churches today. Because they want the audience. They want the money. Don't get me started. I'm going to go over there. Next verse, please. And when he had thus spoken, he took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of them all. And when he had broken it, he began to eat. We just had communion. Next verse. Then were all, then were they all of good cheer. And they also took some meat. Now I want you to understand, this was not in a ship that was steady. This ship is being tossed to and fro, back and forth, and yet they, it seemed like their, their fear was dissipate, dissip, you know, just going away. Just starting to be lesser and lesser. And they had more hope now. I believe because they believed, that they believed in that God had this. He's got this. 
Next verse. And we were all in the ship, 200, three score, and 16 souls. Wow. 276. 276 in the ship. Can you imagine? They didn't have toilet facilities. And you know what happens when you don't eat. You can imagine. Next verse. And when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship. But those they start casting stuff out, and they cast out the wheat into the sea. Keep going. And when it was day, they knew not the land, but they discovered a certain creek with a shore into which they were minded, if it were possible to thrust the ship in there. Now understand, the ship is free, free to go wherever it wants to. Go ahead, next verse. When they had taken up the anchors, they committed themselves unto the sea. What that means is they just threw their hands up, didn't steer the ship. Let it go. Now, please, understand what I'm saying. I'm not, I'm not asking you to, when you're driving your car home, to close your eyes and let go of the steering wheel. Don't do that. You will crash into something. But they did that. They committed themselves to the sea and they loosed the rudder bands. In other words, what was steering the ship so that they couldn't steer it anymore. And they hoisted up the main sail to the wind. Now remember, the wind goes back and forth different directions. Can I tell you, God is in control of the wind. They landed exactly where God wanted them to land. Next verse. And falling into a place where the two seas met, they ran the ship aground, and the, forepart, the front part of the ship stuck fast and remained unmovable. But the hinder part, the back part, was broken with the violence of the waves. That's some strong waves beating up against the back of that ship, and it's breaking the ship up now. Breaking the ship up. That old enemy's coming in saying, I got you now. I'm going to sink this baby and you're all going to die. Next verse. And the soldier's counsel was to kill the prisoners. Lest any of them should swim out and escape. That's lovely, huh? You're in a circumstance, now it's getting worse. Now the soldiers want to kill you because if they lose a prisoner, they get killed. So now the enemy says, well, if I can't get them through the water, I'll have them killed. But the centurion willing to, to save Paul kept them from their purpose and commanded that they which should, could swim should cast themselves first into the sea and get to land. In other words, the, the soldiers that were guarding them, let them go first to land and then let them come. They're going to come to land eventually, so you'll capture them. Next one. And the rest, some on boards, some on broken pieces of the ship. And so it came to pass that they all escaped safely to land. Let me tell you something. You may find yourself in a very dangerous situation, a very dangerous circumstance. But believe me, if you believe God and you trust God, God's got this. Next verse. And when they were escaped, then they knew that the island was called Melita. And the barbarian people showed us no little kindness. In other words, these people were strangers. They didn't know who they were. But they were so kind to them. Remember, now understand this. It's winter. They didn't have suitcases with clothes in it. They had the clothes on their back. They were in the water. Their, wa their clothes are drenched, soaking wet. It's winter time. Now they come on land, and these people are showing them favor. Can I tell you, when you make it through the circumstance and situations you're in, on the other side of that is God's favor. It will cause your faith to grow. 
It will cause you to trust him more. It will cause you to look to God to say that God, no matter what I go through, God's got it. God, you've got it. It says, And the barbarous people showed no kindness, therefore they kindled the fire, and they received us, everyone, because of the present rain and because of the cold. Wow. Next verse. And when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks, he laid them on the fire, and there was a snake right warming itself by the fire. And when Paul took the sticks and he threw it on the fire, the snake came up and bit him. It was a venomous snake. And then what happens, when the people saw that, they said, this guy must be a murderer. The, the sea didn't get him. But now he's going to die. But when, when Paul shook that snake off back and he threw it into the fire, and they didn't, they, the Bible says they didn't see him swelling up. That's from venom. So we know it was poisonous. When they didn't see him swell up, they said, surely he's a god. <laughs> from one end to the other. But I want to encourage you this morning. I want to encourage you this morning that you belong to God. You are called by his name. You are his. And that no matter what you go through, no matter what you face, can you put my PowerPoint back up there again? I want this to go deep in your spirit. God's got this. No matter what circumstance you're in, no matter what you face. Now understand, you have to be obedient to the word. Those men had to stay in the ship, otherwise they would have lost their life. But God always gives you another chance. That's right. Paul said in the beginning, he said, if you lose from here, you're going to lose the ship and you're going to lose your life. But then when God sent the angel to speak to Paul, he says, no. He says, they're going to lose the ship and everything else, but you're, the, the, I'm going to give you their lives if they listen to you, if they abide in the ship. For without abiding in the ship, you cannot be saved. Can I tell you? Abide in this ship right here. Abide in the word of God. Let the word of God instruct you and keep you during those times that you go through discouragement. Hallelujah. Even when things look so bad, God can give favor in the midst of that situation. The Bible says, if you are willing, how many are willing? But there's another part to this. And you be obedient. If you're willing and obedient, the Bible says you will eat the good of the land. In other words, you'll have God's favor, but you've got to be obedient. Not the a la carte Bible. Not when you take out pieces and say, okay, I'll do this, I'll do this, but I'm not going to do that. Not a la carte Bible. The whole thing. Lord, I take it all. What you said, and I'm going to follow you the rest of my life. And I know that I can trust you and I can have hope in you because God's got this. You're going to experience more trials and more things in the, in the end of times as we're living in. People are going to come against you. They're going to speak all the manner of evil against you. The Bible, Jesus even said, they're going to bring you before the courts. You're going to be sued. I don't need an attorney on this earth. God's got this. All I need to do is trust God. He's got this. Amen? Let's stand in closing. <clears throat> Say it with me. God's got this. Say it again. 
no matter what you see, no matter what you hear, no matter what you go through, God's got this. Because He loves you. And He has you in the palm of His hand. Now, Father, I pray, God, in the name of Jesus, those that are struggling and going through hard times, those that are watching by Facebook, I pray, God, that they will, by your Spirit, be encouraged this morning. Those that are within the sound of my voice, they'll be encouraged this morning to know that God's got this. Well, Pastor, what about this and what about this? God's got this. Where can I go? God's got this. How much is it going to cost? God's got this. Where do I get? God's got this. Where do I turn? God's got this. Just remember that. Three words. God's got this. Aren't you glad? Lord, we just pray right now, Father, be with your people. Reveal your manifest presence. That in the time of trouble, they will know that you got this. When loneliness and despair come, discouragement, Whisper these words, I've got this. And we can trust you and we love you. Not because we loved you first, but because you first loved us. And you gave us eternal life through your son. I pray for each and every one here, Lord. Bless their going in, they're coming up, they're lying down, they're rising up. Bless them as they go their ways today. And we pray, Father, that you will be with them, Lord, every step of the way. And that you keep them safe. Give them traveling mercies, we pray. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. God's got this.